Remember last week we prayed and uh, put a little picture on the screen of my, my godson, Leo, who had a, uh, he had a surgery on his, uh, like his nasal passages, kind of was having some issues. He's only, he's only two, but he was having uh, some issues breathing, complicating his, his uh, appetite, his sleeping patterns, and so forth. So talked to his dad this week, good, um, good report. The surgery went extremely well to the point where he's not in pain. All, he, all he's taking is Motrin and Tylenol. No need for uh, anything stronger. So he's healing up really good. And, and, uh, and as we said last week, he was, and what I see is he's a, um, he's a type, right? He's a type of individual who is in need of prayer for health and healing. And even in here tonight, we all are in need of health and healing. If it's not you, it may be somebody that you know, a grandparent, a loved one, a friend, somebody who may not be here, but we can stand in the gap. So continuing in that same spirit from last week, go ahead and place your, your hand on yourself and also stretch forward your hand. We're going to pray for ourselves, health and healing, and also for those who are not here um, who are in need of health and healing. We're going to stand in the gap for those who aren't here. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you tonight for healing, God. That's who you are. You're a healer, Lord God. Not just something you do, God. It's the essence of your being, Father. You healed us from sin, God. Surely you can heal, Lord God, of diabetes and pain in the body, Lord God. You can regulate, Lord God, uh, wayward minds, Lord God, and mental illness, Lord God. There's nothing that you can't heal, God. So we stand in agreement tonight as the body of Christ, Father, asking that you would heal those in here, Lord God, in need of healing, that you would heal those in here standing in the gap for loved ones and friends who are in need of healing, Lord God. Healing and health is what you do, God. It's part of your ministry. It's part of your works, Lord God. So, Father, we ask that you would do it now, God. You say in your word that healing is the children's bread, Father. Let us not go without that bread, God. Provide for us as we know you will, Father. We thank you in advance. We give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. In Jesus Amen. Name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> glory to God. Glory to God. I'm prepared today. I got some more. I got a lot of water, and I got back up. All right, so Luke chapter 8, we're going to read verses 5, I'm sorry, verse 4 through 15. Uh, then we'll do a, a bit of a recap, and we'll get into the word. So tend to your soil, uh, soil part 2. Luke 8, 4, the Bible says, And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up, and with it, sprang up with it, and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop. A hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said to you, It has been given to know the mysteries or the secrets of the kingdom of God. But to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now this, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. The devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy. And these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, they go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and they bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, they keep it and bear fruit with patience. Father, we thank you for your word, God. We thank you, Lord God, that your word, Lord God, cleanses us heals us, it leads us, it guides us. I pray that you would speak to our hearts on tonight, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. Quick little recap from last week. Uh, we covered several things. Um, to begin, we understood and we looked at the uh, scriptures that we're looking at from the book of Luke is an account of Jesus speaking to a large crowd, but it's also recorded in the Synoptic Gospels, specifically uh, in Matthew and Mark, Matthew 13 and Mark 4. And the parable of the sower is often regarded as the first parable uh, that Jesus ever taught. And this is because uh, the book of Mark was written first, which is the oldest of the Synoptic Gospels. But we pose the question, what is a parable? Right? We all of us in here heard of, uh, heard the word parable and read parables, but what is it by definition? I gave the definition that a parable is a short, simple story that teaches a spiritual concept or kingdom idea, often using everyday life scenarios. So it's a story that explains or uses simple things to explain larger, deeper, more complex spiritual things. Tony Evans gave a great uh, a great definition of it. He says, Jesus' parables were earthly stories with heavenly meanings. Jesus took ordinary, everyday people or activities, he put them into a story's format, and taught his listeners a valuable kingdom principle that used the familiar to explain the unfamiliar. So that's how we began, a parable. Our first point was a great multitude. A great multitude comes from verse, I believe, 4. This multitude of people represents how far and how wide the word of God is to reach the earth, or in the earth. As verse 4 says, they come to him from every city. That is the visionary path of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is to reach in every, into every city. Quite literally, the words of Jesus was and still is purpose to reach every city, every state, every country, and every nation. And that truism, as we talked about last week, remains today. As we embark upon this study of the parable, the sower, this multitude, we are that multitude, myself included. Point number two was a sower. We had the multitude, that's who Jesus was talking to. And then we also looked in uh, the book of Mark. Remember we said Mark told us exactly where Jesus was. He was in the boat because the crowd was so large. He got into a boat, paddled out a little bit, and was able to be in the water on the boat with the crowd in front of him on the shore. So that way he can see everyone before him, the whole crowd before him. Like the Bible said, he sits high and looks low. That's a depiction of where he was. He was elevated. He was able to see every soul in the house, to see every soul, not only visibly see every soul, but to see the need of every soul that was on that shore. And the same reigns true today. He sits high and he looks low. He sees even those who want to just stay in the foyer and receive the word. He sees you. He sees your needs. The sower. The Greek word for the, the word sower is uh, spedio. It's a weird word. I can't pronounce it. But it means to sow, to scatter seed. And the sower here is Jesus, right? In that story, Jesus is sowing as he tells the story, as he gives the parable, okay? And we looked at Luke 8, 1. It says he went through every city and village preaching and bringing glad tidings of the kingdom of God. That's what he was doing before he even got here into the boat and was teaching to the, the multitude. The sower also represented and represents servants of God, pastors, ministers, right? Spiritual leaders, all right? Um, but even beyond that, it represents those who have sowed seed into your life, whether it be a friend, whether it be a co-worker, anybody who has shared the truth of, of God, the truth of Jesus Christ, the gospel, what Christ did on the cross for you, anybody like a grandmother, a mom, a dad, somebody who prayed for you, somebody who told you right from wrong, we all played the, the role of a sower at some point, or we had a sower sow into our lives at some point. And for some of us, you have been in the role of sowing seeds, right? Of sowing into others. Maybe you're that grandparent. Maybe you're that parent praying for a loved one, praying for a child. And thirdly, we talked about his seed, okay? The multitude, the sower, and thirdly, his seed. 
What is the sower to sow? God's seed. Quite frankly, the seed is the word of God, as stated in Luke 8.1. So there was three things we pointed out. Number one, the seed represented specifically the gospel, right? The good news of Jesus Christ, right? If, if, faith is, if we're saved by faith, we apply our faith to what? The gospel, what Christ did on the cross. That's what saves us, the work of the cross. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. But also the seed represents not only the, specifically the gospel, but it represents the full counsel of God, the illuminated word of God, right? For some of us, the seed may be what God is leading you to do, his purpose on your life, backed up by his word. You read it, you've seen it in his word, what God is calling you to do. And thirdly, uh, before we move on, we said specifically, if the seed is the word of God, whether it be the gospel or the full counsel of God, that is what we are to sow. Sow the word of God. Don't sow your opinion. Don't sow what I would do. Don't sow what you heard on TV. Don't sow what you heard uh, Mike Larry down the street say. You know what I'm saying? Don't sow something that you heard through the grapevine. Sow the word of God. And number three is God's seed that we're sowing. It's God's seed. It's God's seed that we're sowing. We talked about Simon who wanted to uh, buy the power of the Holy Spirit. God's seed is what we're sowing. It's not for sale. Amen. We're not sowing selfish ambition, not sowing hidden motives, again, not sowing our opinion. A seed has everything it needs to begin new life. Uh, it is in the in the same manner, God's word is complete. It's lacking nothing. It'll be here forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word and his promises will last forever. It's an enduring word. It endured the many times we rejected it, but we all have rejected it at some point, whether it be the gospel the first time you heard it and you just, it fell on deaf ears, or whether it be a word uh, in due season that you didn't want to hear. God's word is complete. God's word has power. Okay. And then number four, we wrapped up on the first type of soil. Uh, we talked about soil, rather. I'm sorry. We talked about soil, and we said what soil represents. Soil in this parable represents the hearts of men, specifically the condition of the hearts of men. As we get into it tonight, we're going to talk about four different or varying types of soil. Stated in a different way, there are four different conditions that the seed of God's word can be sown into. Four different conditions of, heart, of our hearts, the hearts of men. And we pointed out that it was noteworthy, that everything that we talked about, all the different components of this parable, remain the same. They're interchangeable. They're not varying, except the soil. The multitude is the multitude, no matter the setting. Whether it was Jesus in the, at the, in the water, looking at the shore, and everybody before him, ears open, ready to hear the word of God, or whether it be in a setting like this, or whether it be in a setting of uh, prison ministry, whether it be in a setting of uh, rock the block, evangelism ministry. The crowd is the crowd. The multitude is the multitude. It stays the same. The seed is the word of God. It's unchangeable. It never changes. And the sower is the sower, whether it's you or whether it's one of, whether it's God or whether it's one of his servants, whether it's you being led by God to sow a seed. The condition of the soil and the condition of our hearts may vary. Vary with the hills and valleys of life, the ebbs and flow of the lived experience. And this is why it's important, important to tend to your soil. I tend to my soil, I tend to my heart, you tend to yours. And we preface before we got into the first type of soil with this, with this uh, paragraph here, this, this statement. Prepare your perspective before we study the different types of soil. Instead of categorizing yourself as a particular type of soil, Approach the parable as a challenge of every listener, with God's help, 
to first identify the condition of your heart, the condition of your soil right now. And second, begin to cultivate the soil, tend to the soil of your heart so that the good word of God has the best effect in your life. Amen? Amen. Then we got into that first soil. And that came from Luke chapter 8, verse 12. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So the first soil is the wayside soil. We talked about how the wayside was the traveled path. Some translations call it the footpath. It was where everyone walked so that they wouldn't walk on the tilled land where the furrows were. Right After you till some land and the ground is broken up, that's called furrows. Where the passerbys would not walk so that they would not step on the good soil. The wayside or the footpath was hardened because all of the traffic and trampling along that path. The soil on the wayside was so hard that the seed could not penetrate the ground. Therefore, the seed would not be exposed, I'm sorry, the seed would be exposed to the birds who would be lurking on the nearby trees or circling in the air, patiently waiting for the opportunity to swoop down and take away the seed, the precious seed, the powerful seed. The hearts of men can also become hardened as we talked about last week, how from being walked on, from being used, being abused, being trampled on, being overlooked, being cast away, being neglected, sometimes by the ones who should love you the most. Or from poor examples of quote unquote church folk. Other things can harden your hearts from within. We talked about it, bitterness, unforgiveness, and that doesn't matter if you're at fault, or I'm sorry, if this happens to you by no fault of your own. The one willingness to forgive produces calluses in our hearts. It hardens our heart. Jealousy and envy, being so jealous that you can't be happy for a person, another person, a brother or sister in Christ, a co-worker at work, it hardens your heart. The wayside soil, or the hard heart, hears the word, but does not respond to it because of the hardness of the soil. So what happens? The seed of God's word does not penetrate the hearts of these individuals at all, whether it's from uh, being trampled on and being used, being abused, whatever it may be. The gospel can't penetrate. So Satan, represented in this parable, by the birds in the air, swoops down and snatches the word from their hearts. As, like the Bible says, lest they should be saved. He snatches the word, eliminating that opportunity. I'd like to point out again that even the wayside soil, they did what with the word of God? They all heard it. But it had no effect because of their hard hearts. And again, we got to look at it from a perspective of you may not be in that place now, but there may be some in here tonight that you are. Whether you are or you have been, I can with confidence say that we all have been in a place where our hearts were hard. By way of self-introspection, look within. It may not be now, it may be when you first came, when you first heard the gospel. I can recall my story. The first times I was being invited by my mom to come to church, to come to Bible study. I had other things to do. I wanted to go work out. I had to go to Reds. But I praise God that he didn't give up on me. I praise God that he didn't. And he's not giving up on anybody in here. So the wayside soil, hard heart, the word doesn't penetrate, doesn't have an effect on this heart. But there's hope. Moving on to the second type of soil. <clears throat> rocky soil. The Bible says, but the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, they receive with joy. Now we have a reaction. And these have no root. They believe for a while. And in time of temptation, they fall away. 
The conditions of this soil is sufficient to get the seed started. It germinates, it develops, and develops, but there is nowhere for the root to go. The root is unable to spread down towards the damper soil. You see, the, the further that, this, that the roots of the, of the seed grows down is where there's more moisture. Although the layer of rock is not visible on the surface, it hinders the seed from fully developing deep roots. And when the sun's warmth intensifies upon the seed, it begins to dry the surface of the soil, and the plant dies from a lack of moisture. You see, the seed that fell on the rocky soil sprouts quickly because the soil is warm. A seed needs warmth. It needs the right temperature for it to begin to break that seed and begin to germinate and grow. That condition is there. There's a bit of warmth there. But its roots cannot penetrate deeply into the soil because of the layer of rock beneath the surface. So the temperature, when the temperature gets hot and the climate becomes dry, the sprouted seed only withers and dies. The seed withers because the layer of rock heats up, causing the moisture, the moist nutrient-dense soil to dry up also. Now, the seed cannot get its necessary and needed nutrients. Needed to grow deep roots that can withstand unfavorable conditions. This soil lacks water and favorable temperature for growth. In other words, the initial temperature is right for it to germinate and begin the growing process. But because that layer of rock that is right below the surface that we can't see starts to heat up and dries up the moisture, it lacks enough moisture to really grow. The water is the way in which the nutrients in the soil is transported up the roots of the plant to deliver its nutrients. Now Luke 8.13 says that the rocky heart hears the word of God and receives it with joy. Again, we see a reaction to the word of God in a good way. Receive it with joy. When reading or sitting under the preached word of God, there are ways a soul can respond. A few examples. For some, you realize how sinful you are. You realize how far from God you are or how you have been. And you begin to weep as you understand the burden of sin and unrighteousness, you weep in repentance of your sins as you turn to your Savior. Anybody been in that place? Anybody have that response to the word of God before? Yes, sir. Or what about for others? Maybe you've been in this, in this place as well. You had this response. Well, you lift up your voice with a voice of triumph from a heart of understanding that Jesus won it all on the cross for you, defeating sin and washing away your shame and guilt. Though you were counted as a two-time loser, now through the work of the cross, your soul sings 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God who gives us the, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This represents those who respond with a voice of triumph. They shout, they scream, glory to God. They look good in worship. Again, some weep. But that is what is seen above the soil. They hear the word of God. They receive it with enthusiasm. But that is as far as it goes. They do not become established in the faith. That's what, that's what the roots of a plant does. It establishes the plant. The rocky soil, those who are content with only being a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word. There is beginning growth, but below the surface, Nothing develops. They are joyful in the discovery of God's truth. They are excited, and it influences their life to a degree. In other words, they are, these are fair-weather Christians. While they receive the word with joy, they fail to grow deep roots in God's word, fail to grow deep roots in his precepts, in his promises. They react well, but fail to believe deeply. They fail to act on Psalm 1911. They fail to hide God's word in their heart. And the joy that had abruptly ends because of difficulties 
and persecution. When hard times come, because of the undevelopment of their faith, because of the shallow roots, they fall away. They fall away. And again, this represents the heart that receives God's words, rejoices in it, but as soon as the temperature of life heats up, they fall away. How can the temperature of life heat up, you say? Maybe it's in the marriage. How can things heat up in a marriage? Arguments, disagreements, stubbornness on both sides, get on each other's nerves. What about finances? Ooh. Not making as much money, something changed on the job. Not having as many clients in your business. No more bonuses. A lot of companies cutting costs. No raises. Things dry up on the job. Maybe you're not the favorite anymore. Someone else in your circle is being blessed with the things that you are praying for. The temperature of life heats up. Other ways the temperature of life can heat up is by way of persecution. The shallow believer, the, the, the believer with the heart of shallow soil, runs into a, a situation where they're talking about God in public. And those they're talking to or somebody in the circle don't like what they're talking about. And here comes persecution. You begin to be criticized for following Christ. What you talking about? Begin to be uh, criticized and persecuted for not getting drunk, not getting high, not being intoxicated and bragging on it no more. Get persecuted and talked about for not lying, for being honest, for not cheating, for not stealing, for doing the right thing, for not clubbing, for not fornicating, persecuted for doing the right thing, for not robbing and jacking. Persecuted for following Christ, for wanting to pray, for wanting to forgive and let go. Things get hot and dry, and when they do, they don't have the moisture of God's word to nourish them, to grow their roots. Once again, the fervor that had abruptly ends because of difficulties and persecution. And as the passage says, as the scripture says, they fall away. They fall away. Anybody ever seen that before in your, your time in Christ? They fall away. The word of God nourishes the believer. It's our daily bread. It's sufficient to grant us with every spiritual vitamin, every spiritual mineral needed to grow, to blossom, and reap a harvest of God's children, as God's children. A few ways that we can grow deep roots in Christ. Let's start number one with prayer. More prayer, more power. Spend time in prayer. Spend time talking to your God. Pray for yourself. Yes, pray for your family. Pray for others. It's one of my favorites. Give thanks for the blessings in your life, but give thanks for the blessings in the life of others. You see a brother or sister being blessed? Yeah, thank them. You know, hey amen. I'm happy for you, this, that, and the third. Look, sit in the car with them. But what about something special about taking what you've seen and going into the secret place and giving thanks? But not with the blessing that he put on your life, but the blessing he blessed your brother or your sister with. Taking that, that extra step, that extra mile to give God praise in the secret place for your brother or your sister. Another way we can grow deep roots and avoid and tend to our soil and avoid from being shallow is by fasting. What fasting does, it decreases our fleshly desire and our desire to be shallow or being content with being shallow. And it increases our awareness in God's word. Prayer and fasting is a great way to grow deep roots in Christ. And that is the, the soil, the, I'm sorry, the uh, rocky soil, the seed that fell on rocky soil. The shallow Christian, the heart that is content 
with just a little bit of God, with just a surface level knowledge of God, not concerned with growing deep roots. When I was studying this, I saw the person who got saved yesterday but want to be teaching and preaching and leading something. This is why. Because when persecution and temptation comes, they fall away. This is why we avoid that. Now let's talk about the third soil, the thorny soil. The thorny soil. Remember, when we look at these different types of soil, these different conditions of the heart, examine ourselves, whether we are here now, whether we have been in this place before, and where we want to be moving forward. Luke 8, 14, now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, they go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit of maturity. The seed planted in the soil among thorns, they germinate. They begin to grow. The seed has enough moisture and warmth to begin the growing process. The soil is plowed deep enough for the seed to spring up or as the Bible puts it, to go out of the soil and develop a small plant. But perhaps the plant even blossoms into a beautiful flower. The thorny soil has enough nutrients for the plant, for the seed, to actually flourish to a degree. But invasive thorns also grow with the seed. And just as the seed blooms, the thorns bloom. The thorns grow also. This creates a competition for the nutrients in the soil. Remember that, that moisture and the water in the soil is what transports the nutrients from the soil. That's why a lot of people compost and do those type of things and put um, scraps from uh, vegetables, scraps from uh, fruits and food, those type of things that are nutrient dense. They put it in their soil, it decomposes, and now you have soil that is nutrient dense. The competition between the, the, the thorn and the seed, they're competing for the nutrients in the soil. Both the seed and the thorns need the same nutrients to survive. Physical thorns have sharp points that cause pain. If we touch them, yeah. These thorny weeds rob the good plants of moisture, light, nutrients, and space. These weeds are very aggressive in their growth and they reproduce Rapidly, rapidly. Again, the soil has what this seed needs, moisture, light, nutrients, and space. Unfortunately, the thorns reproduce faster and begin to choke out the good seed, leaving the seed with no nutrients, no more potential to grow and develop. In all the life that sprung up from the seed, it dies by way of suffocation keeping the seed from bearing mature fruit. Weeds on any day of the week will outcompete almost all native vegetation as they have an earlier growth in the spring. They get a head start. They get a head start on what? On the moisture, the space, the warmth, what's needed to grow, the nutrients in the soil. Weeds are masters of survival and quickly can dominate the entire landscape. Weeds cannot be ignored. If you ignore the weeds in your garden, what's going to happen? It's going to be, you're going to have to start all over. Yes, sir. I had to do that a few times. As they do not suddenly go away, but they spread like wildfire, if not aggressively dealt with. Don't play with the weeds. Don't play with the thorns. That's why when you would see older folk be walking, be go check the mail, they would see some weeds and what they would do. Get to pull them. In my, my early days, first, you know, first home, I would see the weeds and I'd be like, oh, I'm gonna get that tomorrow. I'm gonna get that. I'm gonna get that when I cut the grass. I'm gonna cut the grass this weekend. And when that time would come, it'd be too late. Weeds can also be carriers of toxins, diseases, and pests that ultimately destroys the crop. I'm going to tell you about my pecan tree in my backyard, y'all. Been having this pecan tree. We've been in the house about 10 years. I hadn't seen a pecan in about seven. 
Like, for real. I hadn't seen any pecans. The weeds and the thorns have overtaken that soil, choking my pecan tree, hindering my pecan tree from bearing any fruit. Now, the purpose of a pecan tree is to produce what? Pecans, right? Now, it's not the pecans I like. It's the little small, hard pecans. I like the big, kind of soft shell. Yeah, that's the good one. That's the ones you can eat on the dime. OK? The weeds and thorns are thriving while the pecan tree is dying a slow death. I almost wish it fell last night toward the north, <laughs> away from my house. I might start praying that. The purpose of the tree is not lived out. Why? Because of the thorns. Now let's get to it. The thorny soil represents here the heart that is overtaken with thorns. Overtaken with the cares, the riches, and the pleasures of this life. This is worldliness and a desire to be near the things of this world. A little leaven leavens the whole no. A heart that is in competition for the things, ways, and desires of this world. As 1 John puts it, specifically verse 2, chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. The world is passing away. And the lust of it, just like my pecan tree. A thorn is a symbol of the flesh and that God is not enough. Thorns are symbolic of a lack of trust in God and a lack of faith in God's faithfulness, faith in his promises, faith in his word. Thorns will consume our love for God, replacing them with an idol to devour our thoughts and emotions. Thorns always choke and suffocate the word of God in the heart and do not allow it to come to full fruition, causing us to not bear fruit of a God-led life. Now, because God is in control in this heart, the thorns are. I'm sorry, because God is not in control of this heart, the thorns are. Like my pecan tree, he not in control. He can't do what he was made to do because of the thorns. I'm going to get to it one day. Thorns are a detour, a wrong path to follow. And they have severe consequences for the health of our heart. They have overtaken this heart, the thorny heart. Now I have a question here. What is that competition for your heart and causing you not to bear fruit? What is choking out the word of God in your life, competing with the nutrients of God's word, of God's spirit? What is at, at competition with you for the things of God, hindering you from producing, hindering, hindering you from being and doing what God has called you to do? Whether it's your overarching purpose on your life or something specific he's purposed on you in this season for you to do an assignment? Is it the drive, desire, and love to make money that's choking out and competing with the nutrients of your heart? Is it the pride of your accomplishments at work, in life, or even your accomplishments at church? Is it pride that is competing with your heart and wants rulership and wants the nutrients is it the things and people that your eyes lust for? Is it the things that satisfy your flesh? Acceptance, approval from others, what other people think of you. Is that at, comp at competition with your heart? I have a little insert from a devotional that I read that I think is pretty good. Listen as I read. It says, the thorns stranglehold on the plant, on the plant strengthens. So the stronghold that's on the plant from the thorns, it strengthens. And the plant is choked more aggressively as it is suffocating by the compression of the thorny weeds. The new plant is grasping for oxygen. It is struggling to receive sunshine from heaven and is dying of thirst 
as it is robbed of life-giving water from the soil. The thorns are multiplying at a staggering rate, and the tender plant is being overwhelmed and slowly killed by suffocation, lack of care, and starvation. Finally, the plant is crushed under the weight of the thorns, and of all potential for fruit vanishes as it withers and dies. It is killed by strangulation and an aggressive invasion of its life support system. May God help us to never allow these thorns, these cares of life, these things that are competition for our heart, to suffocate the word of God from our hearts. Give God some praise. Amen. So again, let us examine the condition of our hearts. Let us tend to our soil. Is it not the reason to uproot, I'm sorry, is it not the season to uproot the weeds in your life? Is it not that season right now? Amen. To rid the, the, the garden of your heart of the weeds and the thorns that are seeking nutrients? The false cares that compete with your trust in God? Is it not time to uproot those things? That is the soil the seed that fell on thorny soil, the heart that is filled with cares and worries, things that compete with the heart. Now let's go into this last point, the good soil. The good soil. Again, we're looking at these different types of soil, different conditions of the heart, not as where you are right now, completely, but where you are in this season and where you want to be. Good soil, Luke 8, 15. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, they keep it, and they bear fruit with patience. This is where we want to be. Now, the Bible says a noble and good heart. What does that mean? What is a noble and good heart? In the Greek, those words translate to an honest and useful heart. The person with good soil allows the word to change them. <clears throat> James 1, 22. Let's turn to it real quick. <clears throat> 1, 22. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was, immediately forgets what he sees in the mirror. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. The person with good soil looks into the mirror of the word of God and sees how lost and needful he is or she is of God. They see their anger. They see their, their tend to, uh, tendency to gossip. gossip. They see the, their lustful ways. They see how lost they really are, how in need of God they really are. But when they turn from it, they don't forget. <clears throat> they see the kind of person they are, and instead of forgetting what they see, they keep the word close and they put the word in action. I know what the word said. I, I know that, I'm, uh, that I tend to get angry. I know that I, I want to go off at work on this individual. But I, they keep the word close to them. They hide it in their heart that they might not sin against God. I don't, I don't want to do what it is that I, I know I'm prone to do, but I want to I move in a way that, that honors God. That's in obedience to the word of God. Thank you, Lord. They put the word in action. The disposition of the heart of good soil is, God, you're right, and I'm wrong. Yes, I don't bring to you my opinion, trying to ask for you to make my opinion right or prove that I'm right, but I surrender my heart to you. I surrender my heart to your word. I surrender my heart to your will. Good soil we're talking about. A noble and good heart is, is a surrendered heart. 
Surrender to what? To God's word. Now, after surrendering, surrendering to the word, the heart of God, I'm sorry, the heart of good soil can keep the word of God. For one cannot keep the word that he or she has not surrendered to. The good soil is surrendered to the word of God, that he may keep it. To surrender is to willingly allow one to rule or to reign over your decisions, well-being, and direction of your life. To keep in the Greek means to keep secure, to hold fast, to a keep a firm possession of. I can't keep the word if I'm not surrendered to the word of God. It can't have rulership and lordship and reign in my life if I'm not surrendered to it. Not to be like a shallow Christian who will read it, but it doesn't go deep. You allow the word to develop, to grow roots, to hide it in your heart. To keep or to surrender to God's word gives the connotation or the idea of obedience. The heart of God, the heart of good soil obeys God's word. And lastly, the heart of good soil bears fruit. It reaps a harvest, a harvest that is a hundredfold. This is the heart of good soil. And it bears fruit of holiness, of love, of joy, of peace, of kindness, of faithfulness, of self-control. It bears fruit of godliness. Godliness. Good soil. That's where we want to be. Surrender. Obedient. You can't be obedient to what you don't surrender to. You can't keep what you have not surrendered to. <clears throat> the word can't develop your heart and grow unless you surrender. It can't bear fruit unless you surrender. Bearing fruit gives us the, the depiction of a plant growing up and bearing fruit. Think about a, um, what, what we have in this area. Uh, a fig tree growing up and bearing fruit. A peach tree growing up and bearing fruit. But also it reaps a harvest, a hundredfold. So not only are the, are the, the plants growing upward and developing into a mature singular plant, but it multiplies. It multiplies, meaning the seed sown in good soil, it not, only spread, it not only grows tall, but it spreads wide. It spreads wide, just as much as it grows upward. Now, some of us in here have been sowing some seeds that you're looking to reap a harvest. Maybe you're sowing some seeds into some children, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, Sowing seeds in your brothers, your sisters, your in-laws, your co-workers, your friends, your cousins. Been sowing seeds in the prison ministry, the nursing homes. Sowing seed into new territory. Oh, but what if you would just tend to your soil? Tend to your soil. And let that good soil produce a harvest. Produce a crop that not only grows tall, but grows wide. Isn't that a depiction of the kingdom of God? Isn't that what God wants for your life? For you to not only grow tall and, and everyone look upon you and see the, you bearing fruit, but also below the surface, your roots growing deep into his word, growing deep into his ways, growing deep into his precepts, that you would be like a plant, a tree planted by a river, that you would receive the nourishment of God's word, that you would have a fountain of water next to you, the word of God, Jesus Christ, that you would have a well that would feed your roots that would never run dry. God is faithful to cause the seed of his word to grow tall and spread wide, to reap a harvest, a harvest of what? Of saved souls. All those souls you've been praying for, 
<laughs> the Bible says a hundredfold. That's multiplication. Yes, sir. You've been praying for how many people? Ten people? Ten times a hundred, that's a thousand. A hundredfold. Anybody in here ready to reap a harvest? Anybody in here ready to reap a harvest? Anybody in here ready to grow tall and wide? Tall and wide. In closing, every fruit that every fruit bearing profitable tree starts with a seed. If the seed grows from seed to fruit, from seed to harvest, it is determined by the condition of the soil. The seed of God's word is meant to produce fruit. Just like my pecan tree, it was meant to produce pecans. Yes, the word of God is meant to produce fruit. It wants to blossom. It wants to produce a harvest of fruit in your life. When and if God's word reaps a harvest in your life is determined by one thing, the condition of your heart. Tend to your heart. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for who you are. You're the Lord of this field. You're the Lord of every harvest. The harvest is we praying for. You're Lord over this place. You're Lord over our lives. We submit and we surrender to your word tonight. Now, by way of your Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak to every individual here tonight, myself included. Give us spiritual eyes to see and to discern, Lord God, where we are. What is the condition and the health of our soil right now? <clears throat> the soil of our hearts. How healthy is it? How nutrient-dense is it? How shallow is it? How many thorns are choking out and at competition <coughs> for the seed of our hearts? <coughs> Father, we ask that you would guide us tonight, each individual, give us eyes to see <coughs> where we are. <coughs> God, we rest in you tonight. With confidence, Lord God, that the condition of our souls, the condition of our hearts, does not have to remain where it is. Where we are now is not an end-all, be-all. <clears throat> but through your word, we can cultivate the condition of our soul, the condition of our hearts. Some in here have hard hearts, Hearts that had not fully received the truth of God, the truth of Jesus Christ, the work of the cross. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died. He hung on the cross for our sins, dying a sacrificial death for every soul that sinned. For every soul that sinned must die, the Bible said. And he took that penalty. He died that death. And some in here had not believed that. If that's you, we're going to pray, and we're going to pray another prayer, just asking God to lead us and help us to cultivate our hearts, to surrender to his word. For those in need of salvation, pray with me. Say, Most High God, I admit I'm a sinner. I've done wrong against you and against others. I confess it. But I also believe that Jesus died on the cross for the sins I've committed. He paid the price. I apply my faith to the work of Jesus on the cross. And by faith, I am saved. Every hand, every head bow, go ahead and just stretch forth your hands real quick. We just want to receive the work God cultivating our hearts. Father, I thank you tonight for every 
heart here, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that you never leave us unto ourselves, God. I thank you that your word, Lord God, is enough to nourish our hearts, to cultivate the soil of our hearts. So God, in the name of your son Jesus, tonight I ask, Lord God, that you would deal with each and every one of us individually as you deal with us collectively, Lord God. We're your people, called by your name. God, we humble ourselves and we pray, Father, what if we all tend to our soil? For real. It would strengthen us as a group. It would strengthen us as a people. It would strengthen us as a church. Help us to be real and look within, God. Give us spiritual eyes to see if there's unforgiveness, if there's pride, if there's envy, jealousy. Give us eyes to see and hearts to understand, Lord God, if we're shallow, if we're content with being where we are. If we don't want more of God. Give us hearts to see, Lord God, where we're being stubborn and hardened. God, I pray, Lord God, you would forgive us, that you would lead us, that you would guide us as a people. I thank you, Lord God, for the work you're doing. We look forward, Lord God, to a heart of good soil, no matter the season, no matter the storms, no matter what competes against our heart, God. Grow the, the seed, Lord God, the, the roots of the seed. Grow them deep in our hearts, God. Mature us in your word, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, let me pray a little benediction over you. Father, I thank you for your people. I pray that you would protect them as we depart, God. I thank you for protecting us last night in the weather. I pray, Lord God, that every need of any individual here, that you would supply it. That you would keep us, lead us, and guide us, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.